Good morning, Hope. <laughs> and good morning to Bible Life, too. Yesterday, on Bible Life. On behalf of Bible Life, I just want to thank Hope for continuing to allow us to use the space to gather, to fellowship, worship, to study the Word of God. And it's been such a blessing for Bible Life. And so we just wanted to thank you and also give glory to God. As Pastor Peter has said, I said, hey, we're joining you this Sunday. And he said, as long as you preach, no. <laughs> he just said, would you be willing? And I said, I would be honored to. I understand you guys are in a series about prayer. And so I want to remain in that series. And I want to share how God's word has encouraged me in my life through prayer. Hope that I can see you in the next few months. I can see you in the next few months. But I want to admit, and I just want to share that I hope in Bible life are so much alike because uh, we're a small body of believers and we're able to interact like this even during worship. And that is such a blessing for me because I feel like sometimes I talk too much <laughs> and I want to hear other people talk. And I want to hear how God is working in their lives and how God is moving and how God is challenging them. And so to hear that we ought to live loved is what a blessing, right? To live every day like we are loved is, 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 is such an encouragement. And who are we that, Lord, you are mindful of us? What a blessing that is, too. Just to hear those two things this morning among the others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your love and your grace and your mercy that abounds in our lives each and every single moment. From the second to the minute, to the hour, to the day, to the month, year after year, your love abounds and it continues to do so and we praise you for that. We thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, was raised from the grave that we may draw near to you to be able to declare you our Father and us your child. We thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing now, and all that you're going to do. Lord, I pray you would quicken our hearts and open our minds to hear your word. May it be a blessing to those of us that are here, just as it has been a blessing to me who have received. We thank you for this time. We thank you for everything in our lives, Lord. We praise you, and we thank you for drawing our hearts on this holiday weekend just to be able to be in fellowship and prayer and in the study of your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Prayer. When I think about prayer, there are several passages that come to my mind. The first one is in Luke chapter 11. In Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, I'd like somebody just to read that out loud for all of us, please, if you would. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Luke Chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. If anyone is willing, I'd like you to just stand up and read that out loud for all of us, please. Thank you. So when I think about this passage, I think as believers, the first thought that comes to mind is actually verses 2 to 4, right? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. We use these four, these three, four verses to share with those who are new in the faith. How do I pray? Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I believe now. How do I pray? And we go to this passage and we say, well, this is what Jesus says. 
But the more and more that I reflect on this passage, as important as our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come. Lead me not into temptation, meaning, God, I plead with you, keep me from sinning against you. Verse 1, as I'm reflecting on this for today's message, stood out to me. It says, it happened while Jesus was praying in a certain place after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. You see, when we look at the actions, the words of that disciple, where something about Jesus praying, when he had finished praying, he goes to the Lord and he says, Lord, teach us how to pray. I think that speaks to the heart of that disciple. It speaks to his heart because he's saying, I'm a disciple of the Lord Jesus. And there's some way, somehow, what I'm seeing, the way my Lord is is speaking to our Heavenly Father, there's something about that, and I want to know what that is like. And so as a disciple of Jesus Christ in our lives, do we have that desire to know how to pray? Some of us are are new in our faith. Some of us have believed in the Lord Jesus for many, many years. But in our lives, the more that we, the more time, the, the, the more that we grow in our Lord, does our desire to know how to pray like the Lord prayed, does that grow along with it? Or are we comfortable like I am praying three times a day, and that only happens at breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Do you, do I have a heart that desires to know how to pray like the Lord Jesus? And not just know like in our mind, know, oh, this is, what we're, this is how we're supposed to pray. But in our hearts to say, Lord Jesus, teach me how to pray. Holy Spirit, help me discern your will for my life. Teach me to pray according to your will. Do you have that in your life? Do I have that in my life? Do we have a desire as the disciple of Jesus Christ to know how to pray? And if we don't, what a great example. Lord, teach me how to pray. The second passage that I think of is in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and go to Colossians 4, verse 2. Verse 1 actually says this. You know, in the book of Colossians, right, Paul, the theme of it really is, in Christ we have been made complete. But here in chapter 4, verse 2, I'm actually going to read verse 1 first. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. And we might think, well, this is talking about masters and slaves, slaves and masters. That doesn't relate to us because I'm not a master or I'm not a slave. But the truth is, even though that's not relevant to us as masters and slaves, it's relevant to us as husbands, as wives, as children, as parents, as grandma, as grandpas, as elders, pastors, church members who are called to love and be fellow workers together. But verse 2, it says this. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Three things stand out in this single verse. Devote yourselves to prayer. How many of us in our prayer lives devote ourselves to prayer? I reflect upon my own life. If I would devote myself to prayer the same way I devote myself to learning the patterns of fishing walleyes on the St. Croix River in the spring, in the summer, and in the fall, how would my life look like? Or if I devote myself the way I devote myself to pickleball, learning the technique, the form, the positioning, the shot selection, how would my life look? look differently if I committed that same amount of devotion to prayer. I love to hear from one of us, what has worked for you in your devotion to prayer? And I know we're not going to share it in a boastful way, right? But I love just to hear, hey, this is what has worked for me in my prayer life. This is how I devote my time to prayer. Is anybody willing to share with the rest of us? 
Thank you all for sharing. I certainly can relate to all of you. There are times in my life where I feel broken that I need to be on my knees. My face needs to be on the ground because I don't know what to say, but to truly just be there and say, God, I don't know what's going on, but I trust in you. And there are also days in my life where my mornings are so rushed that I don't pray, but I get in the car and instead of turning on the radio and listening to everything that's going on already, I'm saying, mighty God, be with me today. Be with the patients that I'm going to see. Be with the people that I'm going to encounter today, Lord. Help me be a light. And so you're absolutely right. I relate to all that you all are saying. Devote yourselves to prayer. Are you doing that? How are you doing that? And as a disciple, do we have that heart? It says, Lord Jesus, teach me how to pray. The second thing that stands out in verse 2 here is keeping alert. Sometimes my prayer is so repetitive, right? Lord, thank you for this meal in Jesus' name. Amen. I say that three times a day. But as I was preparing this, one thing that really stood out to me, how God moved my spirit, is that my oldest son, my children are doing distance learning. The two youngest aren't because they're too young, but the four who are in grade school and middle school, we are all lined up in our basement, and they're on their tablets and their headphones, and I'm on my screen doing my stuff, and I keep hearing my older son grumble as he's doing schoolwork. And I turn to him, and I say, Chang, what is wrong? And he says, Dad, we're learning all these methods on how to do math, and we're going to get tested on it, but I know I'm not going to use this in real life, and I don't want to do it. And I say, Chang, yeah, I wish they'd teach us how to fix a car or how to balance our checkbook and all those things, but they don't. But what have I told you in the past? I know, Dad, these are things that I just have to do, so just keep pushing through. But as I learned this, this, this second point in Colossians 4, 2, about keeping alert, that night I go to my son and I said, hey, Chang, can I pray for you? And he says, yeah, Dad, you can, as always. But my prayer that night was very specific because passage, the word of God, stirs my heart to keep alert. What's going on in my son's life? It's not just, Lord, be with my son as he falls asleep tonight. Comfort him in your arms. Allow him rest. Thank you for loving him and blessing him. But this night it is God I know my son. He's really struggling as the school year is going to end. And he's frustrated and overwhelmed with all these things that he has to do. But Lord, would you give him the strength? to finish out this school year as we look forward to summer break. Are you keeping alert in your prayer? Are you devoted in your prayer? Are you asking the Lord, Lord, teach me how to pray? Are you devoting your time, your energy into learning how to pray? And are you keeping alert through the Holy Spirit? What's going on in my wife's life? What is going on in the lives of my children? What about my parents, my brothers and sisters, my church members, my co-workers? What is going on in their lives, Lord? Help me discern so that when I come to you, I come with intentional requests, trusting and believing and anticipating that you are mighty and you will do according to your will for your glory. Are you keeping alert in your prayer? Or are you like I, Lord, thank you for this meal in Jesus' name? Amen. The third thing that stands out is an attitude of thanksgiving. Hope in Bible life, I promise you that the very reason that you are sitting here today is because the grace of God is upon you. Whether you are sitting here as a believer standing firm upon the Lord Jesus or you're sitting here in doubt, in question, in fear, in anxiety, in depression, in worry, the grace of God is upon you if you are sitting here today. I always tell Bible life, if you are still hearing the word of God, the grace of God is still upon you. How many people in our lives no longer hear the word of God? Because worship is not in their life anymore. Praise is not in their life anymore. Brothers and sisters who encourage are no longer in their lives. But to hear the word of God, to be in fellowship, to worship, to pray together, to study the word of God together, this 
is the grace of God upon you, upon me. And to be able to approach the throne boldly because of the blood of Christ, what he has done for us, we ought to have approached prayer with an attitude of thanksgiving and not take it lightly. To be able to pray in itself is the grace of God. Do we see it that way? Or is prayer such a burden for us where one of my buddies joke, before I say amen, I'm already laying in bed. Do we have an attitude of thanksgiving in regards to our prayer life, the ability to approach this holy God? Lord, teach me how to pray. Give me a heart that is devoted to prayer. Keep me alert, Lord, in my prayer life. And when I approach you, mighty God, may I approach you always with a heart of thanksgiving regardless of what I'm going through, how I'm feeling, how my day went. The third passage that I think of when I think about prayer is found in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. So if you have your Bible, let's go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Verse 6 and 7. The book of Philippians, when Paul writes, the theme of Philippians is to rejoice. Rejoice always, rejoice, right? And so that theme in the book of Philippians is beautifully portrayed in verse 4 and 5 in chapter 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your de- gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. But the passage that I think about today in verse four, chapter 4, verse 6 to 7, it says this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying that in prayer, through prayer, that this peace of God that surpasses all understanding, this peace of God is what guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Are we asking the Lord, teach me how to pray? Are we devoting ourselves to learning how to pray? Are we keeping alert? Are we approaching the throne with thanksgiving? Because all of these things, when we do these things, the Word of God tells us that when we approach the Lord, We receive this peace from the Lord that protects our hearts and our minds. When I read this, I think to myself, in my fear and in my anxiety, in my depression, and even in my joy, what do I do first? Do I approach the Lord? Or in my fear, in my anxiety, even in my joy and whatever's going on, I'm trying to figure it out on my own. Or am I seeking the Lord, seeking his peace, his understanding that protects my mind and my heart? Lord, teach me to pray. Help me devote myself to a life of prayer. Keep me alert, mighty God. Let me approach your throne with a heart of thanksgiving always. Because in doing so, your word tells me that in prayer, I receive your peace that protects my heart and my mind. So if we've learned all these things, the question I'm not asking you, I'm asking myself. God, if I receive this peace, this joy, this comfort through a life of prayer, why is my prayer life so feeble? Why is it so sporadic? Why is it so every other day, every other night, every other week? Why is it so powerless. And that may not be true for all of us, but it's certainly true for me at times in my life. We get so caught up and I just think to myself, why have I not prayed? Why am I so anxious about that thing and I'm trying to figure everything out on what I'm supposed to do when I can go to my God and say, God, I'm anxious about this. I'm depressed. I'm nervous about this. Help me. My relationships aren't going the way that I anticipate. My marriage is not going that way. My ministry, my work, God, help me. I need your peace in my life. 
if we know these things, why is my prayer life so feeble? And so I think about 1 Peter 3, 7. You guys go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. This is what it says. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Perhaps in my life, my prayer life is so feeble because Scripture teaches that my prayer life can be hindered. And when we look at this specific passage, Peter clearly lays it out that one of the reasons why my prayers can be hindered is because I'm not living my life with my wife in an understanding way. Husbands, any one of you bold enough to share what it means to live with your wife in an understanding way. Any of you willing to share? What does it mean to you to live with your wife in an understanding way? Anybody else? Because I'm trying to learn too, right? I'm trying to learn from you men. Yeah. Wives, like, 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 like you certainly can share too. What does it mean? That's actually going to be my next point is what does it mean to live with your husband in an understanding way? Let me share. As a husband, my fears, my anxiety, my feelings of unworthiness, not being the husband, the father, the son, the brother, the leader, the follower that I ought to be, all these things that trigger my emotions. When I'm going through those things, you know who else is going through those things? My wife. My wife is. And so in my life, instead of saying to my wife, sweetheart, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? How come this? How come that? Why this? Why that? Scripture teaches me that I ought to live in a way, in an understanding manner with my wife. So that changes my approach to my wife. I go to my wife and I say, sweetheart, something is wrong. Help me understand what's going on. How can I help you? How can I support you? How can I encourage you? How can I teach? How can I lead? How can I learn from you? Because scripture clearly says that our prayers can be hindered when we do not live a life in an understanding way with our wife, with our husband, right? Wives are like, yep, that's right. Are you listening to this? Your prayers are hindered because you're not living in an understanding way. But this is applicable to our wives as well. Because in the same chapter, do you know what the Word of God says? Wives, honor your husbands. As wives, when we don't live a life that honors our husbands, you know what that does? That hinders our prayer. Not in a way that God doesn't hear us, but it hinders our prayer because our spirit longing to pray, but our flesh is so corrupt and messed up. Our relationships are so overwhelming that we do not have that heart to fall down on our knees and say, God, I need you. We're just so focused on, oh my goodness, my husband did this again. Oh, my wife did this again. All my children, my parents, all my coworkers, our relationships impact us. So for us as husbands, as men, as brothers, as sons, as leaders, are our prayer lives being hindered because of the way we are living among those that God has put before us? As wives, as daughters, as sisters, are our our lives, our prayer life being hindered because of the way we are living with the relationships that God has put before us? Are your prayers hindered? because of the relationships that God has blessed you with? If so, Lord, teach me how to pray. Help me devote myself to pray, even in this frustration. Help me stay alert, mighty God. Let me approach the throne with thankfulness because I need your peace in my life. 
The second reason that um, Scripture le- lays out for our prayers being hindered is when we do not honor, when I do not honor my wife as a fellow heir of the grace of God. Before your wife was your wife, she was a daughter. Before she was a daughter, she was formed in the womb by the mighty God. So the truth is your wife belonged to God before your wife belonged to you. When you look at your wife today, if she is a believer in the Lord Jesus, how do you view her? What is the first thing that you view her as? Is she your wife? Is she the daughter of my in-laws? Is she the sister of so-and-so? Is it her title, her job? Or when you view your wife, do you view her first and foremost as a child of God and if she believes as a co-heir of the grace of God? Because when we start viewing our wife as a co-heir, as a child of God, that begins to impact the way we act, we treat towards them. Same thing for us as ladies. When we look at our husband, is the first thing that comes to mind, oh, that's my husband. Or is it that's a co-heir of the grace of God? How do we view each other? Scripture teaches us that our prayers are hindered when we don't view, when I don't view my wife as a co-heir of the grace of God. You see, Scripture says, wives, submit or honor your husbands. But right here, Scripture says the same thing. Husbands, honor your wives. Are our prayers being hindered because we don't live a life that is honoring to our husband, honoring to our wife? If it is, Lord, teach me how to pray. Give me a heart that is devoted. Keep me alert. Mighty God, may I approach you with a heart of thanksgiving because I need your peace. Help me honor my wife. Help me honor my husband. Help me honor my relationships, my parents. Help me honor my children. Live a life that points them towards you. The devil's scheme is this in our lives. Maybe our prayer life is so feeble. Our lives, our, our prayer life is so hindered because the devil is saying, hey, Sanuk, go. Go to Psalms 34, 16. Go ahead. Go there, Sanuk. Psalms 34, verse 16. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. What are you, Sanuk? You are an evildoer. You do not honor the word of God. You are not obedient to the word of God. You do not honor your wife, your husband, your children. You do not honor your relationships. Know that the face of God is against you. This is the devil's scheme. And when we hear this, we're like, you know what? I am so discouraged. I'm not living the way I ought to. I'm not carrying out my relationships the way I ought to. How can I go to this God? Because his face is against me. Surely he cannot hear me. Surely he will not answer me. But this is the promise of God. The Holy Spirit says, read on, read on, read on. The devil says, the face of the Lord is against you, Sinek. You're an evildoer. And then Christ has promised, the word of God's promise in verse 17 says, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. Who dares to call himself the righteous? It is he, she, we who believe in the Lord Jesus as our Lord and Savior. By the blood of Christ, you and I have been deemed righteous. So who? The righteous cry out and the Lord hears. Even in our sin, if Jesus is our Lord and Savior, we have been declared righteous. And scripture says cry out because the Lord hears. You who believe who have been declared righteous, cry out because the Lord hears. He is near the brokenhearted. He is with those who are crushed in spirit. The devil schemes God's promise. What will we hold on to? Are our prayers hindered because of this voice that tells us the face of God is upon you? 
or even in our hindrance of prayer in our lives where we hold on to scripture and says, Lord, I cry out and you hear me because of what Christ has done for me. Isaiah says, surely the hand of God is not too short to save, nor his ears too dull to hear. Surely our God hears. I like to give us an illustration. I like to end on Genesis chapter 20. If you go to Genesis chapter 20. In chapter 20, it's right after Sodom and Gomorrah has been destroyed and Lot has been debased by his daughter. And in chapter 20, this is how it reads. It's a long read, but I want you to just listen and follow along with me. It says, Now Abraham journeyed from there toward the land of Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. Then he sojourned to Gear. Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. So Abimelech, king of Gear, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is married. Now Abimelech had not come near her, and she said, Lord, and he said, Lord, will you slay a nation even though blameless? Though he himself said to me, did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And she herself say, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and in the innocence of my hands, I have done this. Then God said to him in the dream, yes, I know that in the integrity of your heart, you have done this. And I also kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you and you will live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die. You and all who are yours. The chapter ends with Abimelech calling Abraham. Abraham, what is this that you have done? What have you encountered? Why have you brought this upon my family? And Abraham's trying to reason, well, she actually is my sister, not the same dad, but not the same dad, but not the same mom, but she is my wife. And at the end, Abraham prays for Abimelech. And what happens is the Lord heals Abimelech and his household. But in this passage, in chapter 20, there are several things that stand out. The first thing is that it is God who reveals truth to Abimelech. When Abimelech takes Sarah, God appears in a dream and says to him, You are a dead man, Abimelech, because this woman is married. So God reveals truth. The second thing that God does in chapter 20, if you finish reading it, is that he keeps Abimelech from sinning against God. Abimelech, because I did this out of the, 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 the pureness of my heart. I didn't know. And God says, I know. I know that. That's why I kept you from sinning against me. That's why I didn't let you go near her. The third thing we see in this passage is that God uses Abraham to pray for Abimelech. God says, go to him. He is a prophet and he will pray for you. And at the end of the chapter, Abraham prays for Abimelech, and Abimelech and his household is healed. As I'm studying this chapter, I think to myself, God, why would you use Abraham to pray for Abimelech? The situation that Abimelech is going through right now, this harm that has come upon his family where you have closed the wombs, is because of Abraham. Why? Abraham. But when I reflect on chapter 20, God uses Abraham to pray for Abimelech for these reasons. First and foremost, God says, Abimelech, go to Abraham so that he will pray. Who will Abraham pray to? He will pray to the living God. To remind Abraham that this living God is present, and not only is he present, he is a God that reveals truth because Abimelech says, Abraham, why have you done this to me? Truth has been revealed to Abimelech. Abimelech reveals that truth to Abraham. Abraham, this is your wife. Why have you done that to me? So God uses Abraham to pray, to remind Abraham of this God who is ever-present, who reveals truth, this God who keeps, restores, and heals. He kept Abimelech from sinning against God. He restores Sarah back to Abraham. Restore this woman to her husband or you will surely die. And reminds Abraham that God is the God who heals. God is the God who heals Abimelech and his household. But one thing 
that truly relates to prayer is this. God uses Abraham to pray for Abimelech, to remind Abraham that God hears the prayers of sinners like Abraham, like me, like us. In our failures, the devil's scheme is you should not pray, you disobedient person. But Scripture says, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears. Abraham's sin leads to Abimelech's travesty, devastation. But here, God uses Abraham to pray, to remind Abraham that God is present, that God reveals truth, that he heals, that he restores. He keeps and he hears the prayers of sinners. If I had to apply everything that we've learned today, this is how I would sum it up, brothers and sisters. As believers of Christ, may our hearts be stirred to pray like the Lord. Lord, teach me how to pray. Devoted, alert, and with thanksgiving. Because it is in prayer that we receive the peace of God which guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Therefore, in our obedience, keep praying. And yet, even in our disobedience, pray. Because in our prayer, we are reminded that the one true God hears us, reveals truth, he keeps us, he restores us, and he heals us. Where are you, where am I in our lives right now? Are our prayers hindered because of the way we've been living? If it is, pray. The answer to hindrance is to pray. And when we pray, the Lord reveals, he restores, and he heals that we may live obediently. And in obedience, let us keep praying. And when we stumble and fall and we feel unworthy, pray. Pray, pray, pray. Lord, teach me how to pray. Help me devote my time to prayer. Mighty God, keep me alert. May I approach your throne with thanksgiving because it is in prayer that your peace overflows my life. It is in prayer that I know that you hear me, you heal, you restore, you love me, you have not left me. Help me live obediently to you. Thank you for the time, brothers and sisters. May the word of God encourage us today. But as we heard earlier, don't let truth go into one ear and out the other. But let truth dwell in our lives and live it out. I keep telling my wife, sweetheart, we get one chance at this life, one chance. And so my prayer is, God, help me love my wife more than I did yesterday. And help my wife love me more than she did yesterday. Help me love my children more than I did yesterday. Help me love the people that you've put around me more than yesterday. And part of the love that I can pour out and demonstrate to those that God has put around me is to truly pray for them. In your lives, are you praying for your husband? Are you praying for your wife? Are you praying for your children, your leaders, your elders, hope, Bible life, your friends, and your family? May the word of God stir our hearts to desire, to know, and to pray. What a blessing, what a grace it is to be able to approach the throne of God. May we not take that for granted.